Okay. No, no, it's just presentation. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so my talk is going to be about how to use Wagtail as a headless CMS. Uh, for JavaScript front ends, because that's what I'm mostly interested in, but it works just as well if you have an iOS app or Android or any other need that's not in the browser. Um, so last year at Ripe NCC, we rewrote a site that was in Plone uh, to Wagtail, and we did it with Django templates, which are great. And this year, uh, we're in the process of rewriting our main site from Plone. And I propose, uh, why don't we use a, a JavaScript front end? Because uh, personally, I like working with them. And um, so, you know, uh, we investigated. This is the results of our investigation. Um, eventually, we decided not to go with it, uh, but that's more down to team composition. So, why would you want to use a JavaScript front end? Um, to me, the most important thing is. Um, it comes down to developer experience. So it's about uh, making smaller components that can be unit tested and uh, linters that actually work uh, and are reliable. I know there's a, an experimental curly lint for Django templates, but I tried it on our code basis and it still has a few false positives. Um, if you throw in TypeScript, you get type checking, which is great. Um, these sort of things are just not there in a templating languages uh, as of now. Uh, maybe, you know, two years, three years, it'll be much better. Um, it's also good uh, if you want to make a clear front end, back end division, if that's how your team operates, if that's how it may work better for you. Um, this is not the case for everyone, I, I know. Um, so for those who may want to stick with Django templates, why would you? Well, you already know them. Uh, there's one fewer moving piece and it works out of the box uh, in Wagtail. So you have to think of nothing different. Um, speaking of um, the Wagtail API, um, it's good. It's mostly good. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but it still assumes HTML first. Um, and it's not a one-to-one -one mapping of your front end. For example, you can see there that I'm looking at page with ID five but if you look at the URL, it's deep nested in the tree of my site. So that sort of thing uh, is a bit lost when you deal just with IDs. So what I'm looking at is something like this instead, where I can just have a one-to-one -one mapping of my front end with all my paths to the back end. Uh, in this case, for example, specifying a content type header, I get the JSON back instead of the uh, HTML page. It's, uh, there are different approaches to routing. One is the one I just showed with content type. One could be to prefix all your calls with an API, uh, well, slash API slash, or with a JSON suffix. Um, I still don't know which one of these would be best in practice. You could also have a separate subdomain with your CMS. Um, at the end of the day, this really depends on your setup and needs. Um, what I do in this case is I have a front end and a back end uh, upstream in Nginx and based on content type, uh, I route differently. Um, now let's look at Wagtail. So if you look at the uh, page uh, model in Wagtail core, you can see that the, um, the return of serve is a template response. So while Wagtail has an API, it's still, um, not headless first. Um, you, it still expects templates. And if you hit it and the template doesn't exist, you get a 500. So what I'm looking at instead is a base page that looks more like this, where the serve method uh, is overridden to return JSON. Um, you can see there, there's a serialized page. That method doesn't exist on, pay, on, ba on page, but we'll, we'll make it. Um, so serializing, as you know, or may not know, is the process of turning uh, Python uh, data into JSON, and that can be sent uh, in your responses. So let's look at it a bit closer. Uh, this is how the serialized page uh, that I would use looks. 
So uh, it checks if your serializer exists. These are all based on Django REST framework. It comes with Wagtail. Uh, so it's technically it's an extra dependency, but it, it's already in there. Um, and then we'll return the type of the page, uh, which is basically the name of the model. That's gonna be useful on your front end if you wanna say, okay, I have a layout for articles. I have a different layout for, um, I don't know, if, if people pages, if you have employees, then they have their own page or something like that. And then in data, we use the serializer, we, we will define to um, serializer model. Additionally, um, I will also use the serializer for context because um, Wagtail mixes uh, views the model a little bit, it blurs the line. So if you use context, you'll just make an extra serializer and it'll work just as well. So let's look at uh, the base serializer. Oh, one thing to note is that base abstract models cannot be serialized uh, in Django REST framework. So, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, nonetheless, we'll make a base page serializer uh, and we'll reuse stuff from Wagtail because why not? So the stream field in particular is a bit tricky. So uh, we'll import the serializers from Wagtail. The rest you can see down at the bottom. So ID, slug, title, search description, all the uh, basic types uh, are handled automatically. So numbers, strings, uh, that's not a problem. Mm. Okay, so with all that said, let's make a real uh, example model. It's gonna be an article page uh, with uh, all the defaults from page and the rich text block in a stream field. Um, of course, you can expand that and we will do that later. Our serializer is very simple. It extends the base page serializer and it just adds body to the fields. Uh, here's our uh, example, it's got a heading, it's got a picture, uh, nothing more. And if we send a request, uh, it looks all right. We have our type article page, we have data, it, it all looks good, except if you're careful, you'll see something weird in there. Um, and that's because, um, as you know, rich text is, um, stored, uh, it's not stored as uh, expanded. So a link will be an, an anchor tag with different attributes and then with um, different functions, Wagtail expands it later. So what, we do, what did we do? We used a serializer that Wagtails provide. Uh, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and use it, but now our links and images are not expanded. Uh, so we're back to the drawing board. Um, let's look at rich text. So we just want to make sure it's expanded and links are links and images are images instead of uh, the internal representation in database. So we'll use a custom rich text block for blocks in the stream field or a custom rich text field in a serializer that for models with uh, rich text fields instead. And you just wanna call the expand the BHTML function on the uh, value of stream field. Note that in Django templates, this all happens when you pass through the rich text filter. Um, so now we apply those changes, uh, we make a request and here's our image. It's not, uh, it's not weird anymore and it will render fine in the browser. But now that we're on, we're on, on that topic, let's talk about images because they are very important and they'll be there whether you like them or not. Uh, I like images a lot. Uh, in 2022, this is what an image may look like in the source of a page. So it's gonna be a lot more complicated than it used to. Uh, and it's got modern formats uh, if the device supports it. Uh, I know AVIF is not in Wagtail, but uh, you never know, it may be at some point. Uh, WebP is in there. Then you will have lots of sizes for different device pixel ratios or simply a responsive layouts. If you have, a, I don't know, an article card and on a mobile, it takes up the whole width of the screen and on desktop, it'll just take a small square. Uh, so you, it, it's good to have different uh, widths uh, and different sizes in there. Also, we'll have a fallback to common formats 
So what we did previously in here is not enough, in my opinion. Uh, this is in rich text. So let's see how to improve that. Um, let's add an image to our uh, model. Um, here is both in the stream field and as a key, sorry, as a field on the model itself. We extend the fields on the serializer and then we test it. And, uh, you know, we get the ID of the image. We don't get anything else. So we need to, to write a serializer for this as well. Um, on this note, um, there are some consideration you may want to do. So one is if you have the means to do it or, you know, you go the cloud in every way where you have dynamic URLs. Uh, the problem with this is if you take width as a parameter in your URL, uh, it takes, uh, you know, in an ideal world, that's great. It's simple for uh, your developers. It's simple for everyone to use. However, as soon as uh, someone decides to be malignant, they can just run a for loop and fill your hard drive with images that go from width one to width a million. And then that's a problem. So what you could do is, I suppose, have extra validation on the route. So you only have some selected number of um, options. If you put in with 199, it, it will throw an error or uh, you go down that road. You can have signature checking, like serve view from Wagtail. Um, the problem I find with signature checking is that you still cannot use it on the client really because you need to have access to the key to generate the signature so you i think you're left with predefined renditions um which are okay in the in a template you would do it like this so you define them and you just use image url uh, with whatever filters you want and similarly in Python, you would have an image rendition field. Uh, in this case, what happens is I passed a filter spec, which is an array of sizes I want. Uh, and then in the repre to representation method, I generate the source set um, and the WebP source set as well. What happens, this is how I use them. So I go back to my serializer, I add fit image as an image rendition field. I pass in whatever values I need that will depend on your front end. So uh, you will know that. And now if I make a request, I'll get source sets back instead of just the uh, either one image or the ID. Uh, something that's very important for editors is of course preview. And uh, there's a Wagtail headless preview package from Torchbox. As you can see, it's very simple to add to your models. Uh, in this case, uh, because we have a base page, everything inherits from, we can just add it there. Um, then there are some extra um, settings to, to add to your settings.py and um, some extra views in your router, API router, but it's, it's pretty simple. And then when it comes to the front end, um, for example, in Next.js, um, you would fetch all your paths from the API. Uh, in this case, um, this is just from Wagtail API. There's nothing custom in there. Uh, you will then uh, make a page for every path. So as you can see here, it fetches that URL. It gets back all the JSON, uh, which is then passed to a page proxy, um, which is basically a router for uh, templates, let's say. Um, as you can see here, it checks the type uh, of model and then it, it goes and sees, all right, do I have that type in my lazy pages and then imports a component, which is then used to render the whole page. So in conclusion, I think headless wagtail is possible as it was just shown by Patrick earlier uh, you may actually want to go down the GraphQL road uh, one day if that becomes viable. Uh, I think to operate a head headless wagtail, you need JSON as a first class citizen. You will not be interested in templates or in your models serving template responses. So I'd say do away with them and 
have one-to-one -one map of front-end path to pages. Uh, you will need a few custom serializers uh, for rich text, for images, or for any other block you make that is not uh, made of simple types uh, like strings or numbers. Um, and with that, um, I will leave uh, some space for questions. You can find me on my personal website. There's a repo that contains the source code of uh, what I've shown here. Still not updated with the latest changes. I'll push soon. Uh, there's also a blog post, which I'll update that uh, it's in written form, if that's how you prefer to check this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mas. And then just a shout out that there is, uh, we had our last two talks talking about headless wagtail. It's very big among our users. There is a headless wagtail channel in our Slack. Make sure you be there for other ways of um, headless wagtail. Um, and we have a few minutes um, for questions um, before we break for lunch. Um, so let's start with uh, in the room and, and we'll also check to see if we have any in Zoom or in the channel. I have one right here. Sure. And can you repeat the last part? Can you explain the text? Cool. Can you explain more about page proxy on one of your last slides? And maybe oh, yeah. go, go back to that slide if possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, are you still seeing it? Yes, we're seeing your screen. Okay. Cool. So what happens here is, um, let's go back one uh, slide actually. Sorry, are you seeing the, the notes? Because I see the weird Zoom uh, green border. We can, we can see all of what you need. Uh, we Just your slides and none of your personal notes. OK, yeah, that's OK. Great. Great. So in here, you can see um, it fetches the page. And if we go back a little bit, I had this type article page alongside the data uh, properly that's um, attached to it. Using that type, what we can do is um, because our path, our dynamic route is uh, catching everything, uh, it's not yet, uh, the division is not yet made. So if you need custom templates, you can go two ways. One is say, I know all my, I don't know, slash shopping slash product ID pages will have the same template. That's one way to do it. In this case, um, what we're doing is catching everything under the same uh, pay, uh, yeah, page, let's say. Um, and then based on the type that comes from the request, it's getting the uh, component to render. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or if I explained it properly. But the idea is that instead of making uh, the routing with file system uh, routing like so many uh, front ends do, we do it in a dynamic way based on the type we get back from their response. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a, a good bit of time if we wanna take more questions or go a little bit deeper into some of these exp explanations. So if, if there are more questions in the room, yeah, great. Um, so the, the YTL API has a, an endpoint to find the Page based on the path. So the Wagtail API has an endpoint to find the page based on the path. Uh, why do you, or are there shortcomings with that that lead you to do the, the approach that you outlined in the first part of your talk? Are there shortcomings to that approach that uh, led you to do things the way you did in the first half of your talk? Yes. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll go back there. So it's on screen. The, diff the main difference between this approach and the Wagtail API approach is that um, you will have the same path on the front end and on the back end. And um, the Wagtail API instead requires you to do some querying with query parameters. I find it's not um, as clear as having basically two layers and one is JSON and one is the rendering. Um, so obviously the Wagtail API exists and it works. So I'm not saying it doesn't, uh, but if you, if you think um, 
in terms of headless uh, and you can actually make the API first class citizen um, and get rid of templating entirely. Um, they still coexist. So uh, they live in the same um, system. Um, I, I like it better this way. I, I guess it's down to preference. Uh, so there, there's not really right or wrong. Awesome. And can someone help me with um, any Zoom questions, if there are any? Just yeah. And if not, we could take some more from the room. Uh, one question from the chat was the page prox is basically the switch for the page components. And the answer is yes. And another question was, I like the one to one map to front end path idea. I wonder if we could implement this in Wagtail by checking if the request contains the header accept application JSON and call in a serve JSON method if that's specified. Uh, I can't answer to that, but uh, I repeat it for everyone in the audience. Um, awesome. awesome, thank you. And we do have another in the in the room. Sure, we have a Wagtailer who works in the civic uh, tech realm, and a lot of them want to use React on the front end and Wagtail on the back end. How much coordination does it take for the teams to, uh, for the Wagtail on the back end and React on the front end? And did I, did I get all the points? Cool, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, so uh, this setup is, uh, it would work very well for that. Um, the only thing you really need coordination on uh, is images, as I said, because the rest, there's really not much of a discussion, sorry. Um, you can, you know, if you have a, a title, a slug, you know, any anything else, you'll just show it. Images are a bit tricky because you will have to coordinate with the front end people to see what sizes they need and predefine them up front, unless you're willing to go down the variable uh, dynamic URL uh, route. Um, so that, that's the only pain point I can see if you need to coordinate. As far as the rest goes, uh, you know, you, ex you expose the API, uh, most of the fields don't really need uh, discussion over them. Uh, and then, of course, you need to coordinate if there are changes. But aside from that, uh, I think it would work fairly well to, to split the work uh, and have front end only and back end only if you want. Awesome. Do we have any more questions in the chat? Any questions in, in the room? All right. 